welcome to the Conversations on Healing podcast, where host Shay Bider speaks with renowned healthcare leaders, practitioners, and thought leaders to explore the world of wellness, the incredible powers of self-care, and what it truly means to heal today. Join us on this journey to become more whole, healed, and connected. Welcome, Joan, to the Conversations on Healing podcast. I'm so delighted to have you as my guest today. Thank you so much. I'm honored to be here. Well, we're going to have a fun conversation because we're going to go into so many different areas. You have a recent book out called Goodbye Status Quo, and we're going to talk about that book. We're going to talk about leadership, innovation, being a change agent. We're also going to talk about your scientific work with CureMark and really the way that you've become inspired to kind of change the face of illness and think about things differently. So I'm delighted to sort of dive into a number of these topics with you. So we'll get things rolling. So the first question I wanted to begin with is, you know, you're the founder of a biopharmaceutical company called CureMark, as I mentioned, and You're currently engaged in autism research and working on the first ever biological drug for autism. And I'd love to hear more about the story behind what inspired you to create CureMark. That's a great question. And um, so I've worked with children for 25 years before founding CureMark and um, as a practitioner and in the late 80s, early 90s, lots of children started coming in to see me who had symptoms or constellations of symptoms that I had not seen before, nor had other physicians. And uh, it was lack of eye contact, significantly delayed speech, a lot of obsessive compulsive like behaviors. And it turned out it was the beginning of this large autism I always call it an epidemic because it's just become so large so quickly. And, um, and in looking at the children, they have similarities of symptoms, but they're not exactly the same. So for example, if a child with autism has speech difficulties or communication difficulties, they manifest a little bit differently. So if you look at expressive language, for example, sort of what we say and how we speak, those things will manifest differently in each child. Some won't speak at all. Some will speak off topic. Some will speak by just reciting soliloquies from videos and things they've seen. So they're all in the same category, but not exactly the same. What was interesting that I noticed in seeing so many children like this was what they ate, what they ate was more similar child to child. And it turns out I discovered a deficiency in about two thirds of them of a particular enzyme that digests protein. And that was a very large finding in as many children with autism um, as it demonstrated. And looking at that and thinking, well, do I have something here that can help these children? And the people around me watched this unfold. They encouraged me to pursue it, which is what I did. So I left practice and started a company. Mm -hmm. I'd already had patents on on the findings and others in the works and a lot of research data to show that this deficiency was indeed significant and real. And, uh, I thought, well, you know, I can only help so many children uh, every day in my practice, but I maybe have the opportunity to help millions across the globe. Mm -hmm. And so I left behind what I was doing and did this. And here you are now the CEO of a company. And, you know, what a significant shift to go from more than 25 years of clinical practice to suddenly being a CEO. (laughs) That's a big shift. Dramatic change. I loved, I read one of the lists that you created, which is the five things I wish someone told me before becoming a CEO. And I thought this was kind of fun to share because we are going to talk about leadership today and, you know, some of the ideas that are critical to good leadership. And 
So I'm going to share these five things and then just let you comment a little bit on it. So the first was, number one, things always take longer than you expect. Number two, you always need more money than you anticipate. Number three, there is a ton of noise in the world that you inhabit and you must tune out the noise. Number four, entrepreneurship is a personal journey. You must grow and be willing to change as your journey takes you. And number five, never let anyone mistake your kindness for weakness. So I'd love to hear, you know, how these five things um, that you wish someone had told you before becoming a CEO have shaped your work as the uh, leader of Curemark. So I think that entrepreneurship is a personal journey. So I think that there are lots of things that you learn along the way if you're sort of awake and willing to learn and you can put those lessons to use in what you're doing. So I think that you have to look at it as a personal journey. It's something generally that you've developed that you think can solve a problem and um, you need to just keep working at it at the same time growing as a person. Part of that growth is basically tuning out the noise um, because, and I liken it in my book to a golfer who is going to take a swing at a ball. And when they swing, they just have to swing. But before they swing, they take all these different things into consideration. How far is the hole? What is in between where you're standing in the hole? How tall is the grass? What's the loft? Uh, what's the wind speed? Is there wind blowing at you or blowing towards the hole? All of those things need to be taken into consideration. But when you swing, you just have to swing. If you swing thinking about those things in the back of your head, you won't make the best swing, right? So you have to just push through it. And, um, and then I, I believe that from um, a, you know, timing and a money piece, especially in my world where, where things are, you know, sort of, you know, upsold uh, in terms of doing something. For example, when you do a clinical trial, what might cost you, you know, $100 in the doctor's office generally costs like $250 or $300 in a clinical trial setting for a lot of reasons. So you have to think about sort of what you're spending and what you need. And knowing that, you know, you raise capital, then you raise another round. Sometimes it takes a long time in between that. Mm -hmm. So you have to keep that sort of in the back of your, your mind that it takes longer and you need more money. And then the, the one important thing I really learned was that uh, sometimes, you know, there's a lot of bravado out there in the CEO world. And I'm, I'm all about being authentic and, and not putting bravado out there in a way that a lot of my other, especially male colleagues do. And, um, and as a result of that, being sort of who I am as a person in a boardroom made these bankers and other people talk to my intern before they talked to me because he was male. And so... I had a discussion with my brother, who's a business person, and, and he said, Joan, he said, they're, they're mistaking your kindness. You know, you, you like to hug people. You, you smile. You don't brag about yourself. There's a million things that you don't do that your counterparts do. So sometimes people don't understand that in the business world, and they mistake your kindness and your authenticity for weakness. And uh, they underestimate who you are. And he said, just use it and turn it around because when you finally do speak or you finally do push back on something, it's gonna be significant. And then they'll get the message. Yeah. And I know, Joan, you do a lot of mentoring with women who are in leadership positions and that's become a very conscious part of how you wanna kind of pass some of this on to other women. And I think, it is very different being a female leader, right? Because we've been playing by a certain set of rules 
for many, many years that now as we have more women in leadership positions are beginning to change. And so the way we communicate and uh, utilizing core values like kindness as central, um, utilizing core values like authenticity as central, these are new forms of leadership that um, not that they haven't existed previously, but that are often being emphasized more by women leaders as being primary and critically important. Um, so I, I love that you're raising that point and helping us to think about not only leadership, but also what is it to be a woman leader in today's world. So I want to dive into, you mentioned your book, I have a copy here, Goodbye Status Quo, and I've had a great time reading it. Um, one of the things that you offer in the book are specific tools to overcome obstacles and really become a change agent. I was very focused on this idea you have around becoming a change agent. And I want to hear, you know, given the course and trajectory that we've talked about already today, going from a clinician who then kind of noticed something that you thought, wow, this could help to solve a problem in the world. Maybe I need to start a company to address this and to help to solve this problem. So you've been on that path, you're a CEO, and now you're writing this book that has a lot to do with, you know, kind of how um, we can function as leaders, how we can change the status quo, how things can look differently, how we can be change agents. So what inspired you really? What was the essence of like why you wanted to write the book, um, Goodbye Status Quo? So I think that what's in the book is basically a compilation of what I've experienced. Uh, as a CEO um, and you know the good things and not so good things and the things that I was able to sidestep because I had some vision or other things and I thought that now post pandemic um, or even while we're in the pandemic the level of uncertainty that people were experiencing and are experiencing even today is very disconcerting to them and I don't think necessarily that change or risk or those kinds of things should be impediments to growth and change. And so as I saw those patterns emerging during the pandemic, I thought, okay, now I need to put all the things I've written together and hopefully they can help someone to grow and become a change agent. Mm -hmm. And there are certain things I believe that are important, like having vision. Sometimes if you concentrate on something completely, you lose sight of what's on the outside or what's coming to get in your way, right? So I think that those are important points that I try to make in the book so that people realize that if they're gonna be a CEO and be a leader and be a change agent, that looking just straight ahead and you know, closing out their peripheral vision is not gonna help them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you have some wonderful examples of that in the book. You cite a, a study where they basically have like an image and imagine like an image of a landscape setting and they block out like the very central part of that image. So imagine for our listeners, like a circle in the center of that image where everything's kind of like blacked out. You can't see it, but you see everything in the periphery around that. And then they take the same image and basically reverse that so that you see very clearly this central circle, um, but then everything around it is sort of blocked out. And so it's this idea of, you know, essentially how our vision functions. So it's, it's a, a study that's looking at that, but you really relate it to a much deeper concept around our broadened perception of things and the value of having a broader sort of perspective and perceptive capacity as a leader. So I wanna have you share a little bit about why you think it's so important to be able to broaden our perspective to be strong leaders. So I think that from a physiological point of view in our body, our peripheral vision enables us to react physically faster. So for example, in the NFL, they actually measure peripheral vision in linemen, for example, because they believe that they can react, those who have good peripheral vision can actually react faster and get those, those couple of seconds sort of on their opponent. So that's a, that's a really important thing. But from a broader concept or a deeper concept, if you have only central vision, 
you can get literally blindsided, right? You could, you, things can come from your periphery that you don't see coming. And that could be competition. It could be the fact that what you're working on might be obsolete because something else has come along. There's a lot of reasons to pay attention to the periphery. And there's been other studies done that show that, that leaders and CEOs who basically take a step away even a, a 10 or 15 degree diversion of their vision actually gain more information to help them with their core project. Mm -hmm. So, you know, belonging to other groups, uh, sitting on other boards, doing other things that you can bring back to the center to what you're doing is really important. Right. I loved the quote that you offered in the book. It's, uh, I believe, from the Dalai Lama, and it reads, I find that because of modern technological evolution and our global economy, and as a result of the great increase in population, our world has greatly changed. It has become much smaller. However, our perceptions have not evolved at the same pace. We continue to cling to old national demarcations and old feelings of us and them. When you, you know, listen to me reading this quote, Joan, how does it relate to your current understanding that you know leaders and innovators and change makers must broaden their perspective and become increasingly more globally connected and seek out more diverse talent? So Christine Lagarde um, spoke at a conference um, in Saudi Arabia that I attended some years ago, and she talked about seats of power that we have always looked at seats of power, that the demarcation was land masses, right? And in fact, there's a war going on in Ukraine now, right now around a land mass, right? And it's, it's somewhat about what's on and in that land mass, but it's more about a land mass, right? And she spoke about how seats of power will no longer become or will no longer be just land masses. There can be cities, there can be companies, there can be other things that have that level of power so that our old way of thinking is not gonna hold anymore. And I think as we think about what can come next in our lives, what will be the next new thing or how we will behave, um, we have to keep that in mind. So while individuals have a broader reach they're still looking at their phones. That broad reach might be in their phone, but it's not looking around in their surroundings, right? Mm. It, it's, it's in a concentrated look. And I was out at dinner the other night and I don't think there was a table around us where there wasn't someone literally glued to their phone, you know, and who knows what reach they had, but yet what was right in front of them, they, 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 they didn't connect to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it'll be quite interesting to see over the next several years how technology, you know, as it's reshaping all of us and the way that we live, how that influences our capacity to see more broadly or more narrowly in our lives. And even, you know, this idea that you mentioned around seats of power and how we've historically often focused that around like land masses or certain um, very physical, you could say very physical um, sort of elements or dimensions of life, you know, who knows what's possible in terms of how we could reorient or reorganize power around value systems or around immaterial things, right? We've had a very material orientation when it comes to power. And what if we had a far less material or orientation and a more kind of values-based orientation? So there's, and that's just one idea. I mean, there's a number of ideas for how we could rethink how we're allocating and distributing power on a global basis, but <laughs> we have a ways to go. Um, you know, one of the uh, pieces that you shared already a little bit in our conversation, and you certainly raise it in the book, is this idea of uncertainty. And you actually have a chapter that you've titled, Make Uncertainty Your Companion, you know, like this idea of really embracing it. And you also discuss how uncertainty is really the first sort of step in design thinking. And you referenced this activity that you did 
um, in a design school boot camp that you attended at Stanford. And one of the first exercises that they had you do was to go to the JetBlue terminal, you know, like at the airport and discover some of the problems, you know, like talk to passengers and like, just get an understanding or think about from a passenger perspective, like what are the problems and how do you solve them? And so this idea of like being curious, being uncertain, being willing to look with a new set of eyes. Um, how do you think all of those qualities help us to um, utilize uncertainty in a positive way to think more freely and to more effectively solve complex problems? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, and I think that sometimes we have a, pre, a preconception about what is the problem. So when I went through that exercise, I figured that wait times for airplanes or delays would be the number one issue that passengers had, but it wasn't. I think there was a level of acceptance of that that was okay, but it's what you had available to you during that time when you had to wait for the uh, airplane and, and the amenities that were at the airport that were really of concern to people. So for example, if you were traveling with a pet in the cabin and you had a very long delay, you know, where's the relief place for the animal? If a mother had to nurse her child, where was she gonna do that? You know, was she gonna do that in the bathroom? Now you see that there were all of these pods in the airports where a nursing mother can, can nurse their child. Or you can order food online and have it delivered to the gate so that a mom traveling with two kids and, or three kids and they you know, don't have enough hands to hold them can actually get food delivered to the gate or a place for the children to play while there's a delay. So that was really eye-opening for me to see that those, that those other things were more important. And I believe that uncertainty brings opportunity. When things are well laid out, right, then it follows a path and there's no uncertainty there. But people don't like uncertainty. They don't like uncertainty and most people don't like risk either. And so when you put those two things together, which is what we had in our last two years in, in this world that we live in, it was, it was traumatic for some people. Mm. And I love, you know, you write this book from already the perspective of being in the pandemic. So it's, it's not written pre-pandemic, it's written, you reference the pandemic, you talk about the great uncertainty of the pandemic, and you actually relate it to the title of the book, where you discuss this idea that essentially through this pandemic and kind of where we are currently right now, that we're in what you call a seam time, S-E-A-M, a seam time um, with the status quo. And you reference how the pandemic has caused these seams in the status quo um, that are more visible. Like we can almost see the cracks or the, you know, the stitching together. We can see these sort of elements that maybe we didn't see quite as clearly before we were in this sort of new sort of pressure cooker, right? Mm -hmm. And right. Um, so I'm interested to hear, you know, you've just said to me that you also think there's opportunity that arises when there's moments like this, when there's uncertainty. And obviously a lot of entrepreneurs embraced the opportunities within the pandemic to create successful companies and to innovate and to do new things. Um, so how do you how do you generally see that we can positively positively embrace change and kind of this seam time um, to manifest new opportunities? So I think the seam time, I think you characterized it really well. The seam time is always there. That's where the it, you know people think of status quo as a, a line, for example. But I believe in that line there are breaks or seams where the innovation could come up out of. Uh, now, since the pandemic, it's got gaping holes in those, in those areas. So where we go to school, how we go to school, where we work, how we work, what we do when we work, all those things have changed. Nothing is the same anymore. And so I think that being able to look at those things and say, okay, there's opportunity here. Uh, I get it that when you're walking a status quo and there's a seam, you gotta make a big jump 
right? He had to make a leap. And people don't like to do that. They'd much rather walk along a path. And so now everyone's been forced to leap to it to another side of their of their you know their journey. Um, and I also liken that seem to an earthquake fault, because up from that earthquake fault comes tremendous power, tremendous change comes. The landscape isn't the same when that power comes from up inside the seam, like in the San Andreas fault, if you think of that as the same kind of seam. Mm -hmm. So I think that it's there, we have to take it and embrace it and, and figure out how to take the risk and to embrace the change that we're seeing and, and help to solve some of the problems. I mean, look at Zoom, how much problem Zoom, Zoom solved during that pandemic. Not that they planned it that way, but that's, that's how it happened. Mm -hmm. and, and we have to think beyond it. So like, for example, Peloton, which, you know, which had traction. Uh, I'm a soul cycle person myself, so I would go. <laughs> that stopped, everybody got a Peloton, right? Right, right. And now that people are going back to the gyms, Peloton's market share has gone way down. So you not only have to take advantage of what the change is, but understand that if it changes again or it goes back to the way it was, how do you pivot from there? Right, exactly. Like, do you create a Peloton gym or, you know, like the what's next, right? As right, the CEO of exactly. That company, you're exactly. thinking like, what's next? Because things are changing again. Yeah, right. I feel like that, you know, myself as a leader of an organization, one of the most important lessons that I've had to learn over these past 17 years is agility. You know, and the, the thing I always equate it to that to me is a very simple real life analogy is being a surfer, even though I'm not actually like a great <laughs> surfer. Um, I think the analogy works really well that you have to ride the wave and it's the wave that's in the present moment. And it's that wave that's going to communicate, you know, real time information to you that you must be responding to you, that you must be responding to in order to successfully navigate it. And if you're not in real time, you know, actually paying attention, actually listening to that particular wave and all the nuances of it, you know, obviously you can fall off that surfboard and take a big tumble in the ocean. So, you know, it's leadership is a lot like that. It's about really paying attention to what's happening right now. And, you know, we create strategic plans, we have imperatives, we have all these things, right? These tools that we use from business school and, you know, wonderful things from Harvard Business Review that we can read and think about and learn about and we can take classes and, but there's this element of just being in the present moment and being responsive and attentive and attuned. And that's attuned, not only, you know, you think of a SWOT analysis to like, you know, the external threats, but it's also attuned to your people, attuned to your staff, like internally, how much strength do we have right now? You know, I looked really carefully at all of my employees when the pandemic hit to just get a gauge on like, how are you feeling? How are you doing? You know, to see like, do we have the bandwidth right now to grow and change and transform? Is everybody on board? Like, is my team here, like, cause we got to do this together, whatever we're going to do. Are we, are we able to do this together right now? You know? And so like that sensitivity to look within and without is so critical and that's present moment focused. You know, you can't, can't do that in the future or the past. You can only do that like right now. Oh, it's so key. It's so key. Just before the pandemic, we have, um, uh, a partner that, um, um, went off to China to visit his family. And um, he was describing the January, early January of 2020, the, uh, you know, the COVID piece in Wuhan. And he was telling me all about Wuhan, it's the largest in, inland port and all of those things. And I finally said to him, you know, you should get the heck out of there because if this is that widespread there, it's going to keep spreading. And so he did end up leaving. Um, and then in the end of February, I went to Qatar to look at, um, you know, at the request of the uh, uh, Qatari ambassador to the US to look at the autism program there because they have quite a bit of autism there. And the pandemic had come there. It had just started. 
When we went into the facility, we had to wear a mask and gloves. And they were bringing their, their, um, uh, their people back from different parts of the world and putting them in quarantine for two weeks before they got out into the general public there. So when I got home, I said to my team, okay, we've got two things to do. We have children in an open label study, so they're getting our drug long-term. We gotta make sure that they have enough drug for like six months. And then I want you to pay all the employees ahead of time for two to three months. And my team was like, what are you talking about? And I said, no, I said, the company that ships out the drug is a very big, big company and they have plants all over, they could shut down. I said, and what if the bank shut down? Because we lived through 9-11 here where one of the banks had no infrastructure. And so we don't know what's going to happen. I want to make sure people have cash in their homes in case they needed it. Mm. And they, at first they thought I was kind of like, you know, overreacting, <laughs> which I don't generally do, but it turned out to be, uh, be the right call because you saw what was coming. Mm. And so I think that those things are important. Yeah. And there's another piece I want to talk to you about, Joan, because I, I really experienced this with the pandemic. You know, I run an organization with touch in its name. We literally touch people like we we touch them metaphorically and emotionally and psychologically and spiritually. But we also touch them physically. You know, we touch them in a number of ways, depending on what's needed and you know, we do some hands-on therapies and those are in the hospital and clinical settings. And they're with kind of the most vulnerable populations often like children who are seriously ill. Um, and so, you know, here we were like the start of a pandemic organization touching the most often immunocompromised, you know, kids with cancer, all sorts of things. We have touch in our name and we could have freaked out. Like as an organization, we could have just like, panicked right <laughs> and I knew I think because my spirit is very entrepreneurial like that's kind of an essential part of um, the composition of who I am and even in my family it runs in my family I didn't see it with fear I saw it um, from a, a lens of change and opportunity like you know we don't have to be afraid we just have to transform and so you know, you mentioned in your book about telehealth. Well, we created a huge telehealth program that, you know, has done, you know, thousands of hours of telehealth services for people all over the world, actually. And, you know, so, but it was, it was coming from so much of what you talk about in the book, a place of not coming from fear, but coming from a place of innovation and noticing that it's, perfectly okay to be dynamic and to change when circumstances change. And um, I think that's a, that's a, that idea of, you know, resiliency, it's a great thing to be talking about with, with leadership and how we, you know, as leaders kind of define the way that we work and it, it's got to have that, that capacity and resiliency. And um, there's something about, you know, not being afraid, even when a part of you wants to be afraid, just kind of like focusing and um, you know, there was like in the story you shared about what you did with your employees and paying people ahead and things like that. There was also like a practical logic in that, um, you know, there was something very practical in you that was looking at it, you know, in, the, in a kind of logical way. And that raises for me, you know, one of the other pieces that you address is this idea of inductive versus deductive reasoning and kind of how we think you know, how we approach things. Um, and you sort of settle on, you think it's important that we use a combination of both inductive and deductive reasoning. And I'd like for you to talk a little bit about that with our listeners and what you mean by that and how we can apply that to our lives, how we can apply that to leadership, et cetera. Yeah, that's great. I'd just like to make one comment uh, yes. uh, around sort of your, your pivot that you just described. You're a service organization. And so you never lost the service piece. You just figure out how to do the operational piece differently. Right. And it's when people combine those two things and said, oh my God, I can't do anything is when the panic and all the rest of that sets in. Mm. But you saw that you still needed to be a service organization because 
there were people still to serve. Oh, yes, more than ever. Like it was more important than ever, actually. Right. And so so you were able to do that in the in the right way because because you were able to maintain your mission and just reinvented it, uh, which is so great. I just love that story. <laughs> um, uh, and, and as far as inductive and deductive reasoning, you know, they both have strengths and they both have weaknesses. And uh, in our, our medical system today, the way we sort of look at, at things, we think about it in terms of symptomatology and that symptomatology makes up a disease or a condition. Um, and therefore they then treat that. So we look for the little pieces. And, you know, in deductive reasoning, we say this is wellness. And when something departs from that, what do we have? So it's two different ways to get to the same, to the same place. Um, and I think that, that each one of them can have great efficacy and also great flaws. So now everything's about big data, big data, just run all this data and find what the correlations are and figure out what to do next. Sometimes that works and sometimes it doesn't work because too many data points clouds the issue. So you have to really be smart about how much data you collect, but what kind of data you collect, how do you collect it and the quality of that data. And I think those kinds of considerations will inform how we go further. Mm -hmm. uh, because if you, so for example, I think I talk in the book, if you do 20 data points and they all turn out to be A, um, and then you do another group of data points and you've got A's and B's and C's and D's, well then what happened here? Did you, did you not look at enough data? Or you know, the same could be true if you can look too much data. So we have to use both um, in terms of, of understanding. So for example, we used, I used a deductive model to look at these kids and said, okay, what's the departure from what is usual? And then we took it through an inductive process in a clinical trial. So we used both things. The discovery was one thing and the testing was another. And I think when you use both of them, you can have a, a, a better outcome because you will have not missed something along, along the way. But we tend to get stuck in one way of thinking about things. And sometimes that, that, that misses the boat. Mm -hmm. and, and in the pharma world, much of the innovation is coming out of biotech. It's not coming out of big pharma. They have sort of shut down their, their investigations because the innovation the willingness to look in other places uh, and not look at things the same old, same old is what fuels that innovation. Um, and so just like, you know, the, the vaccines that are out there, you know, especially the, the Pfizer one, the bio, it was a BioNTech, small German company that figured out that technology. Mm. Uh, so I think that being able to look at things from multiple directions is really important. Yeah. And Joan, when you think about, you know, your future vision with all the research that you're doing with autism, but also with Parkinson's and other conditions, it's broadened beyond autism. You know, what do you hope to achieve? What, what really at core are you, are you wanting to achieve with your work at this stage? So I think there's a couple of things. I mean, I think for me, I would like to get, you know, our drug, which is an enzyme replacement to the kids to help them. So that, that's the first thing. And the second thing is to make people know that you can look and discover things differently. Ours is a patient-centered model of discovery. It's not looking at a, li a library of compounds, testing them for novelty, and then retrofitting them into a disease, which is how it used to be done. So we will have completely disrupted that that portion and to understand that we need to really address the patients more, understand what they're doing. And then the third thing is to break down the silos that that medicine traditionally has. So, you know, it's GI, it's cardiology, it's neurology, it's, 
right? But I think that they go across those silos. You know, diseases go across those silos, not just down the silos. And uh, I often use the, the pancreas as an example. It's an organ, we have a lot of pancreatic cancer right now, so it seems to be getting more attention. But, you know, you have diseases like diabetes, right, which comes from the endocrine portion of the pancreas. And then we have these enzymes that help with digestion or, or a big part of our digestive process that are called exocrine. And while it's the same organ, two different doctors look at it. So um, two different types of doctors. So I think that being able to have cross-disciplinary thinking uh, and look at, at, uh, at people. I see your Tonka behind you there. Yes. <laughs> and, and I've been to Tibet and studied their, their medical system and how they look at multiple parts of the body right. to inform them about what's going on, not just the area of which the problem is. And I think those are really important ways that we need to evolve. And I think, you know, drawing upon your analogy of, you know, how historically medicine has been practiced in Tibet, which I, I only know a little about, but, you know, one of the stories I remember very vividly was the, um, the Tibetan physician who treats the Dalai Lama and, you know, has treated um, many others within that community, like the way of it all starts with listening. You know, you listen to the pulse. That's where it begins. It begins with listening. And I remember literally hearing a doctor recount how he watched, like he just observed. And so this was like a Western medically trained doctor watching this Tibetan physician treat the Dalai Lama. And he said for like 40 minutes, he just like listened to his pulse and like listened with everything in his whole like body and being and they were just in silence and from this like western medical perspective the physician was like what is happening but then on the other side of that afterwards they went into the other room and they debriefed the session and you know using slightly different language than we would use in western medicine this tibetan physician really recounted all of the things that medically were going on within his body. And, you know, he was just like stunned at how he didn't use MRIs. He, you know, he didn't have a CAT scan. Like he wasn't doing any of the things that we do. There was no blood draw. And just by listening, he essentially came to so many of the same conclusions that this Western medical team had come to, you know, through doing all of their tests and the ways that medicine has you know, been practiced in, you know, kind of the States and beyond. And so it's like, fascinating to think about, wow, what different approaches, and yet they're getting us there. And for me, you know, I'm very much into integrative medicine and functional medicine. And, and really what it boils down to for me is this idea of whole systems medicine. Like how do we get a much more kind of comprehensive take on the complexity of who we are? And yes, you can look at an individual organ system and yes, you can do that. And yes, there's value in that. But we've also got to think about interrelationships and interconnectivity. And as you shared, Joan, we've got to listen more to the patient themselves. You know, very often they know more than anyone else that something is wrong. And if we ignore them and that knowledge and that wisdom of them saying, you know, I know the test might not be showing it, but like, I just feel it. I remember you telling me a story. I think that would be sweet for you to share about your friend. I think you were at like a baseball game at Yankee stadium or something together. Yeah. I'd love yeah. for you to share that if you're open. Yeah, sure. So I have a really dear friend and he's my baseball buddy. We've been friends for years and years and years. And every summer we go to, uh, to Yankee stadium together and see the games. And uh, it was the winter time. So I didn't see him quite so often in the winter time. And uh, but we were at a, a friend's daughter's communion and I saw him and he looked markedly different to me. And I'm listening to him talk about, you know, how his knees were much better. They didn't hurt quite so much. And, and, you know, uh, I forget, we was talking about hair or something. He said, you know, I don't think I'm going bald as quickly as I have. And then he described that he was going to have sinus surgery because I think he had a polyp. And so I said to him, did you get a CAT scan for 
your of that the sinus and nose area? And he said, no. So I said to him, will you please go get a CAT scan? So I wrote him a script for a CAT scan and it came up negative. Um, and I said, you know, I think you really need an MRI. He's like, okay, now I didn't even ask a question about the other. Why do you want me to do that? Because I couldn't write that script because he needed his primary because the insurance thing to write it. And I said, you know, you describe, you know, your knees and your hair and your face looks different to me. Like your face seems expanded, your jowls seem wider. Something about the way you look to me does not look right. And um, I said, I, I, it's, it's sort of out there. I said, but I think you may have acromegaly. And acromegaly is a, a disease where your bones keep growing long after they've kind of fused, right? So you've got these issues. So I know his physician, so I called her and she's like, oh, come on, Joan, really? Like you think he has acromegaly? How about I do this? How about I draw blood and we'll see if indeed he has high you know, um, growth hormone? Well, it was off the chart. And indeed he had a pituitary tumor. And how to have it removed and all the rest of those things and, and could have easily had a heart attack because that's one of the ways that those people undiagnosed acromegalics die is from a, a sudden heart attack. And so, and, and the steroid that it produced, right? Kept his knees feeling better and his hair, you know, not falling like out. And, and so those were the little cues, but they were, you know, they were nebulous, but you have to listen to what they're saying because invariably they come in and tell you, um, you know, what's going on with them. Sometimes they point right to it. If you listen and you have to go like this sometimes and get through all of the emotion of it or what they think it is. Um, one time someone asked me if I would look at a, a gentleman or talk to him about his condition. And he had some back pain and some other things going on. And so we just sat and we talked. And he was one of the leading uh, doctors involved in the HIV movement in the beginning. He was on, um, on Reagan's task force and all of that. And a local one doctor from here. And he came in with a three page differential diagnosis of what his problem was. And what I thought he had was not on there which was a reoccurrence of his prostate cancer from 10 or 12 years ago. And indeed that's what it was. And so sometimes they'll come in and they'll tell you, this is what they've got. When, if you listen to what they tell you is going on, you can differentiate. So mm -hmm. you're very right. You've got to listen to the patients. You've got to look at their body. Sometimes you have to touch their body like you did with the pulse and you can get a, you can get a read from that. And that's not a, indictment of, of you know, Western medicine in any way, but when you can combine the two, you can get to, to solutions really fast. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and how, how critical, I mean, your story really illustrates the importance of just paying attention, right? This closeness, like this close kind of observational capacity to just notice. And then, then the listening to, I think is really interesting because it's not just hearing, like you said, with the doctor who came in with the three pages of like, this is what it is, something and you had to actually listen beyond that. Like you actually had to listen even more, more deeply, like beyond his kind of outer story because something inside of you had some sense that actually he was missing, you know, the, the true diagnosis. And so it's, it's also not like just listening. It's, it's a, it's a quality of listening. It's a way of listening that's really intensely focused and also doesn't get caught up sometimes in the spin that people, that each one of us has the capacity to create around our own story. <laughs> exactly, exactly. It's so, and it's so important to see through that, right? It's like, you know, all those, all those pieces, you have to see through it. Yeah, yeah. When you think about, you know, your own life and how you've come to be able to listen to yourself more carefully, um, what, how has that looked in your own life? What relationship have you developed with helping to calm yourself down, to ease your own fears and worries? Like, you know, what's your self-care um, plan or even capacity these days? So I, I, I take, 
it started out with taking life in, you know, one day and then blocks of, you know, six hours and blocks of, you know, five hours. And you know, now I'm kind of down to, you know, every half hour is sort of realizing that it's a new half hour. You know, it's a new time and, and being able to take one step at a time. Because if you think too far ahead, you begin to worry, you begin to have anxiety about things you can't do anything about. You have to continue to do your work and move forward while looking at the vista. But at the same time, if you get caught up in the vista, you won't, you won't move it forward. You'll get, you'll get stuck. And so that's a, a really important part of what I try to do every day is to just slowly move through things methodically. The, when I get in trouble is when I don't listen to myself. You know, I generally have a sense and my team has learned that sometimes they'll say to me, well, I think we need to, we need to do this next. And I'm like, yeah, I get that. But why aren't you doing it? I said, because something needs to come before it. And then that thing will emerge. I'm like, okay, that now informs the step that we were gonna take just now in a different direction. So making sure you have all the information you need to make that next step is really important. Hmm. And, um, and, and paying attention to what that, what that looks like. Uh, every day, every half hour, you know, every five minutes, what does that look like? How do I address that? And how do I move forward, making sure I have all the information that I need? Mm -hmm. And uh, so my team now knows that if I'm waiting for something or they look at me and I'm saying, oh, you're not moving this fast enough, or I think you should do, you know, it will come up. They're like, oh, okay, got it. That's <laughs> what we were waiting for. We're waiting for that piece of information to then inform how we do this, you know, going forward. Yeah, and I love in the story, you just recounted how you, um, reference the idea of emergence. I don't think it's spoken about enough in leadership. I think emergence is really important that we don't just force things to happen. We don't just make things happen. It's not that actually we, we listen and we allow for kind of, you know, an underlying organic emergence sometimes to occur, to transpire sort of of its own accord, right? In right timing with a kind of a natural um, sort of essence or flow that's inherent to the present. And that sometimes just waiting for that emergence then leads to that next step, which you may be able, as you said, your team can identify is coming, but you can't skip over. It's very actually, I, I think that a lot developmentally, just like with a child, you know, you can't go from sitting to running, you know, like you have developmental steps and organizations are so similar. And so sometimes you know, even though you know eventually you're gonna, that child's gonna learn to run, you have to recognize yes, but not yet. You know, there's a few other developmental steps that have to kind of arise or happen or emerge first. And then those will lead to that. Even though we know we're going there, we, there's a, an inherent kind of patience and capacity to wait. <laughs> I, I couldn't say that better myself. There are, there are tools that you gain in between the sitting up and the running, right? That your nervous system needs to and your, and your orthopedic system needs to have, has to have strength in the muscles. It has to have a, you know, a sort of tell around, you know, opposite hand, opposite foot, those things. All of those things are important when you're going from sitting to running, but you have to gain them along the way. Mm -hmm. And if you don't wait for them, that's not always, uh, doesn't always portend the best outcome. Yeah. So those things are really key in sort mm -hmm. of development. Yeah. Well, Joan, I like to ask all of my guests to think about this question and then to address it just in your own words. Everyone does it so differently. But this question of, you know, what does it actually mean to heal? So I'd like to put that to you. How do you describe, define, or see what it means to heal? So I think healing is one of the most individualized processes in this world. And that means different things for different people. It means, and, and everyone does it in a different way. But the one thing that I always told, you know, patients, parents, is that it's a three steps forward and two step back process. It's not linear. 
And when it's linear, sometimes it can fall back. And so it's a process. And I, and I can't underscore that enough. Healing is a process. And again, that outcome of healing can be look very different for different people. And, and so I look at it as a ability to gain more functionality. But, but again, what does that mean? You know, does that mean that you broke your leg and now you can walk again? That's a kind of healing, right? Um, you can have a depression and come out of that depression. Um, and it might, you might go back again into that. So what is, what is that healing? Maybe that healing is a, a, a return to where you were, but again, with the idea that it can go forward also. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a very, very individualized process and, and no two people heal or change in the same way. And you know, what's so curious to me about your definition, and I really appreciate it, this idea of it's an individualized process, um, is that the way we've designed like all of our, so much of our research and randomized controlled clinical trials, it's all designed in the opposite way, right? It's designed around standardization, not individualization, like, you know, one thing across everybody in the trial, like the exact replicated, you know, precisely. And I've I've so often experienced the tension myself between, because I've been involved in a number of, you know, research studies over the years, like in trying to standardize everything to fit in the box of how we've designed a lot of clinical research. And then in practice, when I actually work with a patient, I work so differently. Like it's all um, much more individualized, much more listening based, things diverge um, and so I, I'd be interested to ask you about that, Joan, you know, how do you, how do you see that we grapple with that? Like the, our current modeling and study design, which often looks more standardized and, you know, replicable, um, and then the inherent kind of individualized process that you've identified and spoken to about what healing is. Well, I, I do think that for certain things, FDA will move in a, in a fashion where the patient is their own control uh, because you'll be able to measure the change in someone um, uh, versus a change in someone on a placebo, but it's in their own individualized uh, piece. But I think that we think about change in symptoms I'm going to use that in quotes, as linear. You were in pain at a 10 and now you're in pain at a six. Or you're in pain at a six and now you're in pain at a one. And those are linear, easy scales to replicate, to, to change. Um, assuming that something works, you, you'll get change. But things, other things like probably, I mean, certainly autism, schizophrenia, probably Alzheimer's, they're neurodevelopmental issues. And so the functionality that you either lose like um, in Parkinson's or other things, and the ones that you never gain like in autism are multifactorial. So you may not be able to change someone's ability to communicate until you change, for example, like their irritability, their agitation or some other thing. So we have to get used to looking at it that way and not just looking at, well, you didn't move the needle here and therefore this thing doesn't work. That may not necessarily be true. So I think we have to begin to look at, like I talked before about the silos, it goes across. And we need to start thinking about that in a different way now that we have complex things. So for example, we know now that schizophrenia is not something that just appears in young adulthood. We think about it as 
you know, someone in their mid to late twenties having a psychotic break and then they become schizophrenic or something like that. Mm -hmm. But we know now it's a neurodevelopmental disease. So there are things along the way that could potentially inform that this is gonna happen at some point, but we don't pay attention to that. No one talks about anyone being pre-schizophrenic, right? So I think that we have to begin to really think at the manifestation of what we call a symptom or a disease and how one thing impacts the other and how time actually impacts that as well. Oh, I, I so value what you're saying there, Joan. And I'm actually going to share very briefly two stories that I felt like taught me something about this in a way that um, my logical mind still doesn't like completely understand, but I think it's an important lesson. So for years, Integrative Touch, the organization that, you know, puts on this podcast um, has done these healing retreats. They're very, you know, hundreds of people are involved and we've usually offered, you know, more than 120 different integrative healing therapies over the course of the retreats. We did week long retreats for a number of years and in one of those week-long retreats, we had a child who came into the retreat. She was maybe seven years old at the time, and she had a genetic condition, and she spoke five words at that time. She had five words that she was able to speak. At the end of the seven-day retreat, she increased from five words to 35 words. And like her mom was shocked, like everyone was like so shocked. And they were all kind of asking like, how did that happen? You know, trying to pinpoint like the one therapy, the one thing. And I knew right away intuitively, it wasn't one thing. It was exactly what you said. It was multifactorial. It was like all of the things. It wasn't one thing. And so to understand that you have to have a much more holistic form of thinking. You have to understand how things interrelate, interconnect, are interdynamic, right? Like, so there was this, uh, another very similar story where a child came in, also had a genetic condition. He was at that time about four or five years old, had not walked yet, like just hadn't um, been able to walk quite yet, but they knew he would get there eventually. It was just on a, a more delayed trajectory. And in the course of the week, he learned to walk. And again, it's like, you know, there was this sort of question of like, was it the one thing? And again, I, I genuinely, um, cause I witnessed it firsthand. I don't believe it was a one thing. I believe it was a many thing. And we don't have a lot of um, discussion around that in medicine currently about how do you create, for example, an environment that the environment itself helps people to, make, you know, developmental leaps, kind of like you were saying, where you sometimes have to leap across, right? There are times in our lives where we have to take those leaps. And how do you actually create environments where people can take those leaps and heal? And I'm really interested in, you know, understanding more about that. And those children, both of those stories, like they taught me something about that. They really did. Again, not that I perfectly understand it. I don't, but I built a tremendous amount of awareness around what a collective coherent group of people dedicated to, you know, supporting and helping kids to heal can do. Like it can do something pretty powerful in some cases. And that's magnificent. Everyone, will, I, I could not, I mean, I would completely resonate with that. And I think that people want everything to be prescriptive, right? They want to have I take this, this happens. I do this, this happens. And even in my book, uh, one of the things that I was very conscious of is I didn't want it to be prescriptive because it, it, there's not one thing for every, every situation, right? And so I wanted it to be sort of eye-opening and then the individual could find how to use that in their particular circumstance. And we don't do enough of that in this world. You know, if, if people, I mean, I understand that diabetes is a very big problem, but if you do a significant amount of exercise, the amount of insulin you can take, and again, I'm being very general here, mm -hmm. it's severely reduced. 
but people want the drug. They don't want to do something that isn't going to necessarily produce a measured outcome or a, enough of a measured outcome or one that they can count on every single day. And I think once we get away from that, we can have a much better uh, understanding of our own selves and our bodies and how they work. But right now we're still in that prescriptive piece. Yes, yes. And until we break out of that mold, until we start to look at things from a different perspective, then we're going to still be in that prescriptive piece. Yeah. And uh, it's, it's prescriptions are not necessary. I don't mean that just with drugs. I mean, with everything. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not necessarily, it's not one thing for all people. Yeah. I know it's funny, Joan. I know a number of people now who've gotten off of blood pressure medication through breathing techniques. And, you know, many of them were like super apprehensive. One of them got this machine that came out of Israel that was designed to basically teach you how to slow down your breathing. And he was like, what am I doing? Why am I doing this? This is so stupid. And it totally decreased his blood pressure. And he went off his blood pressure medication and he never would have believed that he could have done that. You know, he just didn't know that by altering the way that he was breathing, that he could make that change. And, uh, you know, so to your point, there we are in a very prescriptive model right now and we have to allow ourselves to begin to at least open to other possibilities um and start to you know safely experiment with other ways of of treating kind of you know illness and the challenges that we face right and and when there's a uh a limitation of matter so maybe every one with high blood pressure cannot be, have it reduced by breathing. Right, right. Right? And they have a limitation of their own matter that requires intervention from the outside. Mm-hmm. And that's fine. Yes. But, yeah. but, but knowing that there is something in between there that could help is, is a really important thing. And when I talk about the diabetes, that's well, well known in the medical literature but it's easier for everyone just to take a medication than it is to actually take time, go out and exercise, just walk or do whatever you have to do. And those those things are not what's talked about, not what's made available to people. Our seniors need those things as much as they need wheelchairs, right? That's right, they They do, they do. Right. And it's really, it's a shift in thinking. So. You know, I, I applaud that in your book, a lot of, I think what you're encouraging is people to shift their thinking, you know, to be open more to embracing uncertainty, to embracing uncertainty, to embracing change, to, you know, to really open up the possibilities of how we approach problems as an example. And I like very much the creativity um, kind of behind your approach. So I want to thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you. Well, it, it's been such a pleasure to have you on the show, Joan, and um, I hope that so many of our listeners will grow and learn from, you know, this conversation and opportunity to speak with you today. Um, if there's any last words you want to share, I will open that up to you. I think I would say to people, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid what lies in front of them. Don't be afraid of uncertainty. Right. And and if you go in fearful, your outcome will reflect the fear. Mm. Um, Now, we're all fearful of different things, but I just think that if you go in with as much positivity and as little fear as you can um, and understand that nothing may be certain and that everything may look different. But it will be okay in the end, because you will have moved through it. Mm-hmm. You know, some people get paralyzed. Don't find yourself in paralysis, just move. Mm. Yeah, those are beautiful words of wisdom. So, you know, when I think about all the families over the years we've served in the hospital, they could approach, you know, every cancer diagnosis, every traumatic car accident, they could approach anyone going through that could approach that with so much fear, right? Like you could very easily, any one of us could just fall into full on fear. 
But the instances where people go through really hard things and somehow manage to approach even that with a sense of hope and love and kindness and compassion, it's extraordinary how different the experience and the outcome can be. So I really, um, I really acknowledge the importance of shifting from a fear mindset to one that's loving and heart-centered and compassionate because it can truly transform the way we go through difficult things. And I've seen it. I've seen it many, many times through very serious illnesses. So <laughs> I'm glad you chose to end on that, on that note. It's a great topic. <laughs> Live with Thank love. Thank you. Thank you. It's great to speak with you. <laughs> All right. Thanks so much, Joan. Appreciate it. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. We hope you enjoyed this episode of the Conversations on Healing podcast. If you haven't yet, please go to Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your preferred podcast platform and subscribe, rate, and review this podcast. It helps so you won't miss an episode. See you next time.